Hello and welcome back to the channel. You've joined myself, Dr. James Gill, for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be looking at the carpal tunnel syndrome. So whilst our, our examination is always going to be useful, the um, history that we get from the patient is going to be much more useful in terms of determining whether or not someone has carpal tunnel. To that end, if the symptoms fit for carpal tunnel, then I'm going to request additional investigations regardless of what my clinical examinations find um, when I see the patient. So to start off, um, we need to confirm the patient's uh, name and date of birth. Could you please tell me your name and date of birth, please, sir? Um, Atali Salvi, 4th of January, 2000. Okay. And do you have any problems with your hands at the moment? I do. I've been noticing sort of pins and needles in my hand and pain which seems to be worked at now. Okay. And which fingers are affected here? Sort of the, these three over here. Okay, so we appreciate that the median nerve will provide sensation to the thumb and the lateral three fingers, keeping in mind we're saying lateral when we're in the anatomical position. The fact that the uh, little finger is not affected, again, moves us more towards a median nerve pathology. Are you right or left-handed? Right-handed. Okay, so it's more likely in the technological day and age where we are now, people using mice, um, typing on keyboards, using their iPads, etc., that the dominant hand may be more affected with repetitive strain issues, again putting pressure on the flexor retinaculum, which forms the roof of the carpal tunnel, which may bring forth carpal tunnel type symptoms. So if you put your hands on the uh, pillow, we use the pillow to bring the hands uh, slightly higher up and so the patient can sit with the hands at rest. Looking over the hands, we're looking for wasting over the thena eminence. And it makes sense if we know what they're called. So in terms of these, we've got a little acronym FAO. So we're going to bring all issues with the, th uh, with the uh, median nerve, with the carpal tunnel, for attention of the thena eminence. So those muscles, very simply, are the uh, flexor pollicis brevis, the abductor pollicis brevis, the abductor, and then underneath that, we've got the opponent's pollicis. If we have a flexor pollicis brevis, it makes sense that we have an extensor pollicis brevis. However, that is not contained within the carpal tunnel, so it's not something we need to be concerned about today. And these three muscles do as they would suggest. The flexor pollicis brevis flexes the thumb, the adductor pollicis brevis abducts the thumb, and the opponent's pollicis helps rotate the thumb round to allow you to oppose the, um, uh, the, the thumb against the ring and little fingers. Obviously we can't see any wasting here, but when the median nerve is compressed and we've got problems with innervation, we're looking about a, literally a lower motor neuron lesion, which as we appreciate from our neurology conversations, then we will get wasting here. We'll also compare on the opposite side to see uh, whether or not we have symmetry, which we do. And that could mean that there's been bilateral wasting, but there doesn't appear to be any increased skin markings over either thena eminence, suggesting we've got normal muscle bulk. We will, however, confirm this when we do um, checking for powers here. We also want to look at the carpal tunnel area itself to see if we can see any scars that might suggest previous carpal tunnel surgery. We also want to look around the wrist and the hand generally to see if we can see any evidence of arthritis, whether or not that's osteoarthritis, where we may get osteophytes pressing in to the carpal tunnel, or whether or not we've got swelling to the MCPs or any of the um, distal uh, and joints, which might indicate an inflammatory arthritis. We can also have a look at the patient overall, keeping in mind that hypothyroidism can be, um, have a connection with um, carpal tunnel, and obviously not in this case, but so can pregnancy. So given we can't see any changes to the hand, we then want to check the, uh, the movements. So if you could just move your thumb up for me. So we're getting the patient to abduct their thumb. Uh, bear in mind that the um, abductor pollicis brevis is the strongest muscle of the thena eminence and it's also the one that's most likely to be affected in um, median nerve pathologies. Um, you can try and get the patient to do various movements and things like that, but I find that quite difficult, particularly with regard to explanations. So it's much better to have the patient get their thumb in position 
and we then tell them to not let us move the thumb. So with your hands in this position, please keep your thumb there and I'm going to try and move it, but please don't let me. So if I just press straight down over the thumb, I'm going to win anyway, because that's not what the um, abductor pulses is doing in terms of abduction going straight up. So I want to press on the lateral side, trying to adduct the thumb back down. So again, pressing with my fingers there, I can easily oppose the patient. So I want to do the same with my thumb and I'm going to try and push them down. And I can move the hand, but I've got much better strength there. And do the same again on the opposite side. And we've got comparable strength on both sides, so that is useful. The next thing we need to do, because opponent's pollicis, which will rotate the thumb round as well as help uh, flex it along with flexor pollicis brevis, is to put your thumb and uh, put your thumb and ring fingers together and don't let me pull through. So I'm going to do the same thumb and ring finger and I'm going to try and pull through that interface, which I can't get through. It's very important I'm pulling through at the interface rather than just making a hook and pulling because although we've established his strength was equal to mine, he's not going to be able to penetrate my finger. So I am always going to be able to overcome that interface. So we need to create our own interface and see if we can pull against it. So relax for me. So having done the movements, we then want to test for sensation. It can often be a bit of a challenge for students to grasp the sensory distribution from the median nerve. However, if we look at the anatomy, it becomes very clear. So we have the median nerve coming out of uh, the carpal tunnel and it splits off to the thumb, the index, the middle, and we can literally follow it up here, half of uh, the uh, ring finger, whereas the other half of the ring finger is, is innervated by the ulnar nerve and is very much not part of the carpal tunnel, is not affected by uh, the flexor retinaculum there. Thus, we should, assuming there are no ulnar pathologies, we shouldn't have any problems with uh, the uh, little finger on either side. So we can use a neurotip or a, um, a, a neurofilament to assess um, the fingers. I like to do this with a neurotip for mapping out sensation areas. So we're going to press over the patient's forearm. So can you feel this normally? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that feels the same on both sides. So if you could close your eyes, please, and I'm going to press around the fingers, please say yes as soon as you feel it. So with that in mind, I'm going to map out the areas of the median nerve innervation. So initially, the thenar eminence. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. So the thumb is fine. We can find normal sensation over the, bed, over the area of the palm because there is a uh, branch that comes off the median nerve just before the flexor retinaculum, so we may get some normal sensation if a patient is affected. We're then going to move up. Yep. 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 Index. Yes. Middle. Yes. Yep. Yep. And then half yep. of um, yep. the ring finger. We can also just confirm yep. that there's no problems over the uh, little finger, which would be innervated by uh, the median nerve and then we repeat this in the opposite hand. There is another way that we can check for sensation, assuming that a patient had commented of loss of sensation, and this is the 10-10 method. So we're going to touch on both sides. Can you feel that? Yes. Okay, so we're going to consider that to be 10 out of 10 sensation. So please tell me if, they, if it feels different. So 10 out of 10? 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Okay, so we have no problems on the right, and then we'd repeat the same on the left. You can open your eyes now. So having done um, movement and sensation, we need to do our special tests. Um, in a carpal tunnel, there are three special tests that we can look at. There is Tynell's test, where we're going to be striking directly over the flexor retinaculum. Some people will do it with a, a finger, but I personally like the re reproducibility of using the tendon hammer. Um, we can also do Phelan's test, where we're going to position the wrists to stress the median nerve, where again, we're looking to see if we can produce numbness tingling or paresthesia. 
and then we can do an additional test which has much higher sensitivity and specificity, Durkin's, where we will manually press down directly over the carpal tunnel, trying to put as much pressure on the median nerve as the patient can withstand without significant pain. So, in terms of tunnels, I'm just going to strike over your hands. Please make sure you stop me if it becomes painful. It's very important that we make sure the patient can stop the examination whenever they need to. So. Did you have any pins and needles when we did that? Slight pins and needles here. Okay, so to the palm, nothing to the fingertips. No. Now that's one area that Tynnels, whilst it has relatively poor specificity and sensitivity as a diagnostic tool, we can use it to look at um, improvement of uh, nerve sensation with regard to healing of the axonal fibres. If we do um, uh, do carpal tunnel release, we slice over the flexor retinaculum, and repeat Tynnels test later as things are healing, would expect that um, uh, paresthesia from Tynnels to have moved backwards. We can then do the same again on the opposite hand, again seeing if we get similar sensation. In terms of doing Phelan's tests, it's often better again to demonstrate to the patient. So I'd like to take your hands, put your um, back of the hands directly together and push your wrists in and we're making sure that we've got the wrist at 90 degrees here, so we're putting pressure on the median nerve in this um, flex position. And we keep the wrists there for um, 60 seconds to see again if we get paresthesia in the median nerve distribution area. It's very important that we keep that 90 degrees. A lot of patients will put their fingers together like so, they will do the positioning in an odd manner if you tell them what to do. It's much better to demonstrate what is required. So we'll assume 60 seconds has passed. Have you noticed any change in the sensation to your fingers? No. Okay. And if you could put your hands back on, on here. So in terms of doing Durkin's test, it's very important, again, like we've done the Tynnels test, to make sure the patient is aware it may be uncomfortable and to stop us um, if they're in any pain. So I'm going to take both my thumbs, I'm going to feel for the borders of the flexor retinaculum, and that's held on in four positions. We've got the uh, scaphoid, the pisiform, the hook of the hamate, and the trapezium at the base of the thumb. These form the anchors for uh, the flexor retinaculum over the top. So I'm going to press directly over the middle there with the, uh, with the tips of my thumbs, pushing quite hard, and I can feel the um, uh, the, uh, the hook, uh, uh, the pisiform form, and the scaphoid pressing against my own fingers uh, or my own thumbs. And I'm going to hold this here for 60 seconds, and I'm waiting to see again if we get paresthesia, numbness in the median nerve distribution. So when palpating over the uh, flexor retinaculum, it helps if we keep in mind where it is that we're going to be pressing and how it is that that's going to be leading to compression over the median nerve. So by putting significant pressure here over Durkin's, I'd expect to be pressing directly over the uh, median nerve to result potentially in pins and needles up to the thumb, the index, the middle and half of the ring finger. Now, with some um, cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, we may find that there is an area on the palm that is unaffected, and that's because some patients will have a, a branch of the median nerve that is coming over the flexor retinaculum before um, the carpal tunnel, providing innovation to this area. And similarly, we're going to, we can see here with the presence of the digital nerve coming from the ulna side, why the, um, uh, the little and the half of the ring finger are unaffected by a pressure over the median nerve, whereas the other digital nerves to the index, middle and half of the ring finger are affected. So again, we'll assume 60 seconds has passed. Did you get any symptom changes with Slight, that? Um, Pins and needles. Okay. Was that in the same location as we did previously? Yeah. So although the Tynnels and Phelan tests are, have lower sensitivity and specificity, using all three tests together does very much strengthen our conclusion. Once we've done the Durkin's test, 
It's also very important to assess activities of daily living. How functional are the patient's hands? And the easiest way to do that is get the patient to uh, undo a button. So if you could undo your button and redo it for me, please. Okay, and then close it again. And have you noticed any problems picking things up, doing buttons, etc.? Um, no, not really. Okay, thank you. We could potentially get the patient to pick up a pen or a pen-shaped object because, again, with the median nerve, the, um, uh, the, the, that tripoding of the fingers is impaired because of uh, loss of um, strength with opponens pollicis and flexor pollicis brevis. So it does appear that your symptoms are in keeping with carpal tunnel. So um, we can look at trying to organise for referral for neurophysiology testing. However, there's often some delays with that and it can be uncomfortable, but we'll put the request in. Do you have any problems taking ibuprofen? No. Okay. So we can look at even giving you simple ibuprofen to see if we can reduce any inflammation that may be there to the nerve. And also organise for a, 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 a wrist um, uh, support that you can wear at night to try and keep that wrist extended. Um, do you have any other questions for myself at the moment? Um, when you're saying about using computers and things like that, I do do that quite a lot. So would you say the wrist sprint at night should help in the morning? Hopefully so, yes. It? It's also worthwhile having a look at your keyboard setup to see if there's anything you can do to reduce the f uh, your wrist going down, the flexion of your wrist, as opposed to the extension. Thank you. We'll also organise a referral to the surgical team who may be able to consider an operation which would help things there. Do you have any other questions for myself about that? No. Thank you. So it's very important the patient is aware of what we think is going on with regard to the diagnosis. We've highlighted what we might be able to do at the moment to try to improve some of their symptoms. Anything that can reduce pressure on the median nerve is going to be important. And if we had other um, health um, problems, such as hypothyroidism, or if we suspected those, it may be appropriate for us to do some blood tests as well to identify if there are any additional causes. That would also be the case if we felt that there was inflammation of the hand during our examination, so perhaps in keeping with rheumatoid arthritis. The patient's aware that we're doing a referral to the surgical team, but crucially we've said for them to consider. It's always bad form to inform the patient that something is going to happen from a colleague where actually they may have a different criteria than you're using at that moment in time. With that in mind, we can thank the patient and we can review things perhaps in a month's time if there are still problems. Mm -hmm. So any questions for myself before we no. sort that? Right, we'll sort those referrals. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the patient is aware of what's going on with regard to our carpal tunnel syndrome. They know what to expect in terms of uh, what we're doing, in terms of potential surgery, and we're trying to help with the symptoms that they have at the moment. Well, I hope that's been a, a good overview of carpal tunnel for you. Please consider subscribing and liking the channel because it tells the YouTube algorithm we're here, and that might help other people to see this video. Please drop a comment down below on any other areas you'd like us to uh, look at focusing on. I think one of the things that seems to be coming through loud and clear is the temporal mandibular joint issues. So we're going to be trying to have a look at that in the next couple of weeks. With that in mind, take care. We'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.